Sylvie Theater on Livingston Street and sold a controlling interest to the mammoth Live Nation. Um, I don't think I have time to talk about Morris Edelson. Come up to me afterwards and ask me about Morris Edelson. Um, important on campus and off campus as well. Uh, I don't have time to talk about Zorba Pastor. Um, he was the found, I had to show you the slide. He was the founding president of the uh, UW Community Cooperative, which lasted for about a year. Um, I do have time to tell you about Eddie. Here in his head shop, no hassle. Uh, selling mad dogs from a cart that I personally drove from Washington, D.C. in a U-Haul. Uh, it would be an understatement to call Eddie Elson interesting or complex. Um, there, there's some beautiful writing from George Hesselberg and Mike Wilmington about uh, his, how, what an iconoclast, his, his, his wit, um, his similes, his metaphors, his flights of fancy, um, the brilliance of, of Eddie Ellison. There are, uh, I have a number of Eddie sightings in the book that uh, coalesce into uh, one item. Uh, when he declared his candidacy for Dane County DA uh, at the Wilson Hotel wearing a gray Edwardian suit and uh, maroon shirt, it wasn't until the 1970s that he declared for DA in the nude at the Dangle. In the 60s, he was clothed at the Wilson Hotel. So I want to get your, your history right. Um, he vowed to not enforce bad laws, such as those against marijuana and cohabitation, warned that not wearing seatbelts would someday be against the law. Now think of that. Um, and uh, he, vowed, he ran for mayor on the American Transcendental Party. Uh, <laughs> Madison's favorite non-resident Jew. Uh, I don't have to tell you about the biography uh, or influence of the founding rabbi of Temple Bethel. All you really need to know is that Madison's best service club, that of course is the Madison Downtown Rotary, has named its Humanitarian Service Award in Manfred Schwarzenski's honor. Um, there's a chair in his name uh, at Edgewood, which is a Dominican Cincinnati institution. Um, Rabbi was great on civil rights. He, he uh, presided over uh, civil rights meetings. He spoke at the, uh, the uh, he spoke at the um, uh, memorial service for Dr. King in 1968. However, he was not particularly good for the anti-war movement or a particular friend of the counterculture. Um, he was great on civil rights, great on building bridges, not good on the anti-war movement, not a friend of the counterculture. Fortunately for the left-wing Jews, there was a religious leader they could turn to because even the director of Hillel was a leftist from New York, Rabbi Richard Winograd, graduated from UW in 1965, vice president of the uh, Socialist Student League for Industrial Democracy, marched with Dr. King in Birmingham, was on that Freedom Flyers flight to Montgomery in 1965, had Hillel sponsor a benefit for the student nonviolent coordinating committee. Hillel itself became a safe haven during the anti-war movement for protesters. During the Mifflin Street block party riots, um, while some young women on the front lawn were providing first aid, the cops came by and hit them all with tear gas. Uh, Rabbi testified to this uh, before the mayor's commission investigating uh, the riot um, and, and was very forceful. Uh, to close, most of the people I've talked about today were either born in the bush and made news as adults, or were young men from elsewhere who made news as 20-year-olds. I'm going to close by dedicating the program to a young man born in the bush who made his news at age 20. Bernie Mazursky grew up at 314 South Orchard Street. He was a member of Beth Israel Center. Graduated from Central University High in 1966, enrolled in the university, but December of his freshman year, he gave up his deferment and dropped out to enlist with his best friend. Army Specialist for Mazursky was an infantryman. He was stationed in Germany. He visited Madison in March 1968, just before his unit was transferred to Vietnam. He was killed along with two other grunts in an ambush in Kantum province on May 4th, 1968. He asked that memorials be made out to the Beth Israel Center. Zakir Zadik Lifraha. Thank you. Have I gone too long?
long, but we have time. We, we, we have some time questions, for questions and comments. And then raise your hand, I'll come around. Okay. Caught my eye first. Thank you for your fascinating, um, moving talk uh, that touched all of us, I'm sure, uh, our memories as well as our hearts. I just wanted to maybe add or amend something to your very beginning. I noticed that you began talking early on about uh, the kosher butcher shop uh, and Zelig Iwanter. And those of us who were keeping kosher at the time, and still do, um, can remember that act actually um, one of the one of the things that happened to Zelig, you, you might be interested in knowing, was that he had a, a falling out with the rabbi at, at that time of Beth Israel Center, um, Rabbi Victor Zwelling, and uh, as a result, Rabbi Zwelling withdrew his kosher certification, his heksha, and so. Those of us who kept kosher uh, were paralyzed because most of us sided with Zelig and we, we wanted to support him in business and he continued his business for a while. Um, but on the other hand, we wanted to have a kosher home so all peoples, whether they were kosher or halal or any, anything, could come and eat in our homes and if they didn't have a heksha, he, they, they couldn't. So I remember buying um, extra meat, um, getting a freezer locker at a store that was then called El Rancho, and uh, storing it, but then we didn't know what to do. And then we began finally ordering meat from Milwaukee, and that was the end of Zelig's shop, as I recall it. Um, uh, also, thank you for mentioning all these other wonderful people, and I'm very proud as a a former um, member of Jewish Social Services to say how many of them supported uh, the agency supporting this today, Jewish Social yeah. Services, especially Dorothy and Gordon Senekin. So it was really touching to hear that too and remember their involvement. Thank you. Thank you for that additional information on Selig. I, I've been in contact with his son, Sidney, and he never told me that part of the story. So. <laughs> well, Sidney was younger than uh, yeah, some Sid, of us yeah, who were yeah, Sid, 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 Sid wedding should, homes. Yeah, but Sidney should, should have known that part yeah. of the story. Uh, Check it out. And, yeah, no, I, I, I trust you, yeah. Yes? I don't know whether you'll be can you hear I me? can hear you, sure. I was part of the teaching staff when Dorothy and Brian uh, canceled the Christmas program. Wow. And I had a PTA meeting coming up, and one of the parents of one of my students wanted to know if the Christmas program was canceled because the Jews were taking over the school. She said that she worked, remember I told that story about the principal who canceled the, Jew, the Christmas program, and she, she worked, she was on the staff at that school at the time, and one of the other staff members asked, no, the parent asked, is the program canceled because the Jews are taking over? <laughs> that was the actual quote. See, this is, this is the great thing about doing talks, is that there are people who are there who fill in the rest of the story. Um, and and it, it's so rewarding to me to, to meet people who can give me that additional information um, and, and have those, those personal connections. Thank you for telling me that. Was, <clears throat> during the Sears protest, was Julius Rosenwald still involved or was he long gone by then? Julius, or, I, 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 I have not come across that name. He was the founder of Sears. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I can look that up. Um, Herb and then over oh, here, yeah. First, let me say one thing about Julius Rosenwald. Uh, he probably was not involved any longer by that time. I think he had died. But Julius Rosenwald, who uh, was uh, took over uh, Sears Roebuck when it was beginning, uh, spent millions and millions of dollars for schools for blacks in the South. He was deeply devoted to the cause of uh, African Americans. Uh, but what I was going to say also on the subject of African Americans is that while the black student strike may have uh, sped up the process, it was already well in the works for an African Studies program, if not a department. Uh, I was on the committee actually at the time. 
And I must say that the strike had its unpleasant elements. Uh, I was uh, giving a class uh, in, on the fifth floor of social science, and for no good reason, the firebomb was thrown right at the, the door of my, uh, the class. I don't think they had anything against me. I don't think they know who was in there. But as they marched through, they threw the firebomb. And for years, until the uh, flooring was changed, uh, the stain of the burn, it, it burnt itself out, but it burnt the floor. So I just thought I would add that. Yeah, but, uh, no, I appreciate that. And, and sir, were you on the feed committee? Sorry? I was on the uh, theme, uh, yeah. yeah, theme committee yeah, the for, and, and also on the committee that established uh, the African uh, American Studies Program. And I must say, it's called uh, Afro-American, or originally Afro-American Studies, rather than Black Studies, because I said we should not call it uh, Black, because this is a racial term, and uh, I think we should uh, resist using racial terms. So that was, your, it was called African American. Now? That was, Sorry? That was your doing? That was my doing. Yeah. Okay, well, work. the rest of the committee went along with okay, it. Okay, good work. Good work. Ms. Gaskin. Well, I think we also had somebody over here, but yeah, good work. Stuart, I just want to say that this was a brilliant talk, and the way you wove the history together and all the parts of it, you did a wonderful job. Uh, and, and I personally, I mean, in addition to seeing our wedding photo there, you know, I was appointed by Paul Soglin to the Equal Opportunities Commission. I became the chair. Lester to the Plan Commission. He became the chair. Jewish Federation president. I feel so honored to be a part of this community. And those of us who came later than the original families who lived in the bush, we are a part of an important legacy. So thanks for tying this together. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, Orchard Ridge's uh, uh, pro -Christ Christmas group was called Save Our Santa uh -huh. SOS. Okay. Yes. Okay. You want to talk about Kibbutz Langdon? I'm sorry. I, I, Kibbutz Langdon? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, oh that was a Ju Ju see, see. Jewish fraternity house, the Jewish house on campus. Uh, one, one of the things I was, I was going to mention is that the book is not the encyclopedia of the 60s and, the, and, and I, I, I could not prepare the encyclopedia of the Jews in the 60s for this talk. So my, my research was stuff that was newsworthy and, and there's, there's levels of the, of the social interaction and, and some of the society and family stuff that it was just too deep into to, for me to get into, so I apologize that I'm not completely comprehensive. Uh, also, there was a covenant in Nicoma that houses could not be sold to Ethiopians. When I went to close on my house in on uh, Cherokee Drive in 1987, I had just left the Dane County Board where I wrote the Dane County Fair Housing Ordinance. So they hand me the deed, and I'm reading the deed, and I get to deed restriction 13 and no Ethiopians. And I say, well, I got a problem with this. And they say, it's okay, it's a, you know, the Civil Rights Act, it doesn't have any meaning. I say, I understand that, but you know, I just wrote the Fair Housing Code Ordinance and I'm, and I'm not gonna, I got a check in my pocket and you don't get the check until you, did, until you expressly disavow this provision. So they went out to the back room, they got some white out, they whited it out. So I may have the only deed in, in the coma that has that provision um, whited out. Probably the white out, but yes, it is. Um, that uh, in there, yeah. Several years ago, they several yeah. years ago they instituted the Scani thing, yeah. which basically means Wisconsin for Wisconsinites, and they sold T-shirts and all that stuff. And uh, frankly, I think that was somewhat anti-Semitic at, at the time, and uh, you know, it never it never dies. Yeah. The only thing is, it's, it's very difficult for me, having been here through 45 through 49, to imagine that there was that much anti-Semitism in later years, because the New York students uh, did very well and uh, integrated, and, and yeah, there, yeah, there, there, there wasn't any problems here. No, we, 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 we were, but the reason the anti-Semitism arose because all these other people were just skating by and we came to apply ourselves and to work and they got jealous of us because we were working too hard and applying and succeeding too much and, and that, 
you know, President Eliot at Harvard says, you know, if we restrict the number of Jews, the anti-Semitism will go away because because then people won't be offended with you. you, you want to know, let me show you something about the level of anti-Semitism in the early days, and then we got another question. Um, we had the second, minor, one of the earliest menorah societies on campus in, in the 19-teens. This is the illustration from the Badger yearbook in 1920. Look at that illustration of the Jews from the menorah society. This is what happens when your Badger yearbook editor is a member of the campus Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> um, and by the way, in, in 1920, there were seven Sinaikos in the Menorah Society uh, on campus, and two Levitans. Um, and I've always wondered what the relationship between the, the native Jews from the bush, like the Sinaikos, and the radical Jews from the East Coast, and, and how, what kind of relationship, and that may be some, an area for future research to find out. Um, uh, what that relationship was. But I think well, you'd be happy to know that, it, it, that at that time, 45 through 49, the, the Jews controlled both the Badger Board and the Cardinal Board. In fact, I was Vice President of the Badger Board. And, and basically, the only, pro the only problem was when somebody, I met somebody in a non-Jewish, I told him my name was Goldstein, the first thing he said, where are you from, New York? And I said, no, they're Jews in the South as well. <laughs> All right, we just have time for one more question, so well, then you'll, uh, you can we, catch students. No, they can, they can start serving while we're talking. Okay. People that have questions, they can start serving. <laughs> this is more of a comment <coughs> than a question. First of all, uh, my name is Judy Rubin. Yes. I was born in 1941 in New York. My mother was born in 1913 in Madison. My oh. mother's name was Beatrice. Sinaiko. My grandparents were original founding Jewish members in this city. I am the only Sinaiko, blood Sinaiko, left in this city. When I came here to college in 1959, both my grandparents were alive, and so were 60 to 70 Sinaiko cousins. My first trip here was in a laundry basket when I was six months old. I was here every summer following that. So I have a long, deep root in Madison. I married Bob Rubin, who was from the Rubin family, in 1961. I was part of all of that that you just talked about. One of the things that you did not mention, because of time, I suspect, but very, very important to me, because I grew up rather insulated, in Long, on Long Island in New York, was somewhere in the 70s, a very prominent teacher, who you may remember, Jan Silvers, spearheaded a committee to change the religious guidelines in the public schools. And Jan Silvers was very successful, and those guidelines were changed. But the election in that year, and I don't remember the details of that election, I took my children, who were very young at the time, to Orchard Ridge School, where I voted, because I lived in that area, to watch me vote to see the process. One of them was in a stroller with my babysitter. We arrived, got out of the car, walked up to the school, and were bombarded with people, with posters and play cards and signs that said, do not let the Grinches steal our Christmas. I will never ever forget that, but most difficult was explaining to my children who these people were and what this was all about. That is a vivid, vivid memory for me and I to share that with you. I appreciate that, but if it was in the 70s, it would be outside the scope of, of right. the Right. I, I just wanted yeah, yeah. to share that. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, know had some, I know we had some other, but if not, okay. I'll get some other. Right. Oh, yeah. I was a little bit in the 1960s. In, 1960, in, in 1965, I had just returned from J Japan when my husband was in the service, and I got a job teaching at Randall School, 
um, third grade, and this was before they changed the guidelines. It's a little pre, pre-religious change story. Um, I taught third grade, and in my class was a little boy named Jack Fetman. His father was Cantor Fetman at, at Beth Israel. And um, Hanukkah came and, and went, and Cantor Fetman called me and he said, you don't know what a mitzvah you've done for my son. No, the, what did I say? No, Hanukkah. I'm not, not, I got my story straight. Yeah, Hanukkah came in and went, and Cantor Fetman said, Jack came home from school and he said, Dad, Mrs. Roth is Jewish. <laughs> so when it came time for the Christmas pageant, he wasn't allowed to, to be there. So I sat out with, with him. And I, I just know exactly how those kids felt, you know, before they did make it a little more inclusive. I thought I'd share that. I always thought of that. Thanks. Okay, we're just going to do a quick question, then uh, Renee's going to do the moan scene. Okay, Renee, we're going to hand it over to you, and thanks so much, Stu. And, uh, Come and talk to Stu if you haven't seen there's uh, books on the table that Stu has for sale and then we're going to hand this over to Rabbi Renee. I'm Rabbi Renee Bauer, I'm the uh, chaplain at uh, Jewish Social Services um, and it's so great to hear about history and then have people all share their personal stories. So while we start our meal I want to thank the Tacoma staff has made us a beautiful meal and is serving us a beautiful meal. And then those who um, would like to say a blessing um, in thanks of, of the bread and the meal. Barahatanai Elohim Melakalam Amosi Lethem Bimaris Amen Thank you. Stay on. Enjoy your meal. Out of the way. <laughs> 